Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm number 2. And you can find that in your pew Bibles on page 489. Even if you don't know the page number or aren't great at looking things up that way, if you take your Bible and flip it open to the very middle, you will most likely be in the book of Psalms. And then if you keep turning back until the very beginning of the book, that will get you to Psalm 2, the second psalm in the collection. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, with trembling. Kiss his feet, or he will be angry and you will perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Happy are all who take refuge in him. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The year is 871, and the great heathen army, hordes of Vikings from Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, have invaded England, bent on conquering the island and its loose alliance of Christian Anglo-Saxon kings. The Vikings have largely succeeded in this effort as kingdom after kingdom falls under their advance, all except for one in the remote southwest corner of the island. The tiny kingdom of Wessex is the last to offer any resistance. Its aging king, Ethelwulf, left behind five strong sons, but one by one they fell. And only the youngest, Prince Alfred, remains. Alfred, at age 22, is not a warrior. He's an intellectual, a deeply religious boy who suffered from illnesses throughout his childhood. And now, in 871, surrounded on all sides with Vikings, with no allies and no brothers left to come to his aid, and little hope or confidence from his own people, Alfred is crowned king. Of course, this is the Alfred who will go on to be known as Alfred the Great, the only English king to bear that title. He's the king who defeated all of the Vikings, united all of England under one crown, and sparked a renaissance in medieval English art, literature, government, and education. Along the way, Alfred personally translated the book of Psalms from Latin into his native tongue, and this is the very first translation of the Psalms into the English language. Alfred did this late in his life, after all his battles had been won, and I like to imagine him sitting in his study in his old age, reflecting back on his long reign and all that he has accomplished as he translates the words of Psalm 2, verse 6. And he writes, And each am their king ye set from God over his don halyan mund sion, 
to them that each lara his willan and his a. English sounds a little bit different now than it did in the ninth century. In modern English, though, Alfred's translation reads, but I, however, am appointed by God, king over Zion, that holy mountain of his, to teach his will and his law. And when Alfred translated the opening lines of Psalm 2, the part about the nations raging and the kings of the earth setting themselves in opposition to God's chosen king, I wonder if those words took Alfred back in his thought and memory to that day when he first became king and to his own desperate prayer on that day to break his enemies with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I wonder this because Psalm 2 is believed by many scholars to have been a coronation psalm of the ancient Jewish people, meant to be read or sung in the temple as part of an official coronation when a new king ascended to the throne of Israel. Just like Alfred's England in the ninth century, Israel was a small country beset on all sides by powerful enemies. And so the number one priority of a good king whether in Alfred's time or in ancient Israel, was simply to protect the people from invasion. This psalm that we're looking at today, Psalm 2, is divided into four different parts with this perfect symmetry to it, and each one speaks in a different voice. If you were to just read the psalm straight through, it's a little confusing. What's this all about? But if you understand that it's a dramatic narrative where each group has their lines, and it goes from group to group as part of the coronation ceremony, it starts to make a lot more sense. So the first part, verses 1 through 3, is the voice of the nations outside Israel. And they speak their part, threatening Israel, threatening Israel's God, and threatening Israel's new king. And then the second part is God's part. God speaks from the heaven, laughing at the challenge from the nations, and therefore inspiring the people, his people, with hope and confidence. When God speaks his part, the primary thing he's doing is introducing his chosen king, the new king whom he has placed in Zion, the holy hill. That's a poetic reference to Jerusalem. And then in the third part, having been introduced, now the king speaks reminding the people of his special relationship with God and of God's promises to defend them and give them success against their enemies. Then finally, in the last part, verses 10 through 12, the people of Israel, now unified under their God and king, speak their reply to all those nations and their kings, warning them and threatening them and making the circle complete. I'm explaining all of this in order to make the point that the context in which a psalm is written and the purpose for which it is used is important. <laughs> that context is important for all scripture, but especially for the psalms. And Psalm 2, right here at the beginning of the book, is probably one of those that, without understanding that context, it is hard for us to relate to as 21st century Americans. In our country, we haven't had a king or a coronation in hundreds of years. That's why I started with the story of King Alfred. But if that story feels a little bit remote, consider this one. On January 20th, 1961, a young John F. Kennedy, recently elected president, stood on the steps of the United States Capitol and said, I have sworn before you and almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. 
In his inaugural speech, he goes on to address other countries, saying, let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. So Kennedy's words included some promises, some thinly veiled threats, some appeals to God, and also the acknowledgement that we as a country were, in his words, embattled in a struggle against powerful enemies. In essence, these are exactly the same kind of sentiments that we find in Psalm 2. Despite the common themes between Kennedy's inauguration, or probably really any inauguration, and the words of Psalm 2, I would imagine that the more recent ones sound more sophisticated, more kind and civilized, and less barbaric to us than the promise in Psalm 2 that the king, with God's help, will break his enemies with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Here again, it's important to remember historical context, and that in many respects, we've made a lot of progress in 3,000 years, maybe. But there's something else I think is important to understand whenever we're reading the Psalms, and Psalm 2 is a good example of this. A lot of times we imagine the Bible as a collection of sacred writings handed down to us straight from God in the heavens in final, unchanged form reflecting God's will and intent and perfection in every word. And so when Psalm 2 describes God as wrathful, angry, and derisive, kiss his feet or he will be angry and you will perish in the way. What are we supposed to do with that? This is the word of God after all. It comes from God, so it must be true. And we as peace-loving 21st century Christians have a hard time wrapping our heads and minds around that kind of a God. Even a seventh century context has a hard time explaining that away. Here's what I think we need to remember. The book of Psalms is a little bit different than most of the other books of the Bible because it's a book of prayers, and prayers go this direction, not this direction. When we pray, we imagine a God who hears, who understands, who is sympathetic, and because of that, sometimes the God to whom we pray starts to resemble, well, us. I'm reminded of the kindergarten teacher who was observing her classroom of children while they drew pictures, and she would walk around the room to see each child's work. What are you drawing? She asked one little girl who was working diligently at her desk, and the girl replied, I'm drawing God. The teacher paused and said, but no one knows what God looks like, and the little girl replied, they will in a minute. Psalms is sacred and divine, not because it perfectly expresses God's thoughts and God's intentions, but rather because it perfectly expresses the hopes, the fears, the desires, and the full range of very human emotions from some very human people. If we're honest, there's not a single one of us in here today who hasn't at some point in our lives wanted to punch somebody in the face, sometimes for very good reasons. Or, better yet, you may have secretly hoped that God would do the dirty work for you, punishing the people you don't like, the people who antagonize you, and making sure they get what's coming to them. That sentiment is just as alive and well in our time as it was in King Alfred's England and in ancient Israel when Psalm 2 was written. Like the psalmist, we still pray those kinds of prayers to God, consciously or unconsciously. 
And you see, the beauty of Psalms is that we get to see and hear all of those heartfelt prayers, the joyful ones, the pious ones, right alongside the nasty and the vindictive ones. And so we know in reading them that we're not alone. And we also know that we're not wrong for pouring out our desires to God, even when those desires are less than charitable. But while God does listen to us, and God always answers us, it's not always in the way that we might want or expect. You see, the prayer of God's people in Psalm 2, whenever they crowned a new king, is that their new king might smash their enemies to tiny bits. And that prayer, well, it didn't work out so well for them. In fact, most of their kings end up being defeated, and ultimately their holy, sacred temple and the city of Jerusalem is destroyed and leveled to the ground, not once, but twice. Still, hundreds of years later, when God finally did answer the prayer that's at the heart of Psalm 2, he sends the king, a different kind of king, one who instead of attacking his enemies tells his followers to turn the other cheek, one who instead of threatening with power and might reaches out to the poor and the dispossessed with kindness and with love, one who instead of taking lives gives up his own. This, of course, is Jesus, the carpenter's son, the peasant king from the rural town of Galilee, who leads a relatively tiny army of fishermen, prostitutes, lepers, and tax collectors. And that irony is not lost on his followers. At his baptism, the writers of the Gospels quote from this psalm, from Psalm 2, putting in God's mouth the words of verse 7, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. But thankfully, leaving out the part about dashing his enemies in pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2, for all its posturing and all its politics, still ends with a blessing. Happy or blessed are all who take refuge in him, in God. I think that one part of taking refuge in God is praying with the brutal honesty of the psalmist when we are afraid, when we are angry, when we are vulnerable, and when we are proud. But the other part of taking refuge in God is learning to recognize and accept God's answers to our prayer when they arrive, unexpectedly, quietly, not always in a crowd or with a crown, not always in the way that we might have imagined or hoped for, but always in just the right way and often in a way that changes and completely transforms us from who we were before and even who we aspired to be into the person whom God is truly calling us to become. Now, I usually end each sermon with a prayer. Today, I want to close with a prayer from King Alfred the Great, a man who knew a thing or two about the Psalms and also about the transforming power prayer. So let his words and his prayer in the face of great challenges be ours today. Let us pray. Lord, almighty God, creator and ruler of all creation, I ask you for favor, great mercy, that you guide me better than I have been able to do for you and direct me towards your will and for the needs of my soul better than I can myself. Fix my mind in your will and for my soul's good and shield me against my enemies, seen and unseen, and teach me to work according to your will that I may inwardly love you above all things 
with a clean mind and with a clean body. For you are my creator and my redeemer, my help, my refuge, my trust, and my hope. To you be praise and glory now and always, world without any end. Amen.